Welcome to In the Studio at Davis Media Access. My name is David Lima, and today in this episode, we'll be discussing the topic of non-stranger rape. Um, joining me today are Amanda Zambor, Deputy District Attorney, and Julia Hernandez, Victim Advocate. Amanda, let's start with you. What is non-stranger rape? Okay. Well, when most people think of rape, they think of you know the stranger in the bushes or hopping out of the van. Those cases are exceedingly rare to come across our desk at the district attorney's office. What's more common is what we're talking about today, non-stranger sexual assault or rape. And those cases are cases, your typical date rape cases, rape of an intoxicated person or an unconscious person. Uh, people that our survivors know, family, friends, friends of friends or even acquaintances. Typically what we see or usually what we see are either dating relationships where sexual advances went a little bit too far or way too far actually when somebody says no and the, the other side doesn't take no for an answer or in these alcohol-fueled environments where parties, either high school or college, everybody's been drinking and the, per the survivor is so intoxicated that they cannot legally give consent or they might have gone to the point of passing out um, so what we're really focusing on on these cases is where is that consent? Is this person so out of it or so incapacitated that they don't know what's going on around them, that they can't make those conscious decisions to engage in sexual behavior? Thank you. Uh, Julia, uh, what are some of the common misconceptions about non-stranger rape? Um, there are a lot. So there's, if you look on any website, there's going to be like, you know, pages of uh, myths or misconceptions. But some of them that I can talk about here are um, false reporting. One of the things I think that um, society is unfortunately given um, because of maybe the media and TV shows is that um, everybody's lying about rape or, you know, women will go running to go report a false rape to get someone in trouble, right. um, which nationally, um, the statistics are something like 2% to 4%, maybe all the way up to 10%, but really usually staying around that 4% mark where it has happened. And the other thing that gets mixed in with that false reporting rate is oftentimes a, um, just because something isn't proven, meaning, sorry, something isn't charged or something doesn't go all the way to a jury trial, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It just means that unfortunately, there wasn't enough evidence for a prosecutor's um, office to go forward with that case. So if that's taken into account with those numbers, then that's not showing true numbers because, again, not saying that it didn't happen, it's just saying it can't be proven, and that's totally different. Um, second thing would be um, when Amanda talked about intoxication, um, you know, if a person is intoxicated at a get-together, a party, whatever it might be, um, if the victim is so intoxicated, they can't give consent. And people think, well, that person was drinking, or that person was drinking, got so drunk, and then made out with this person. You know what I mean? And maybe that was consensual. Maybe the beginning, uh, maybe even they weren't drinking up to a point where they get um, unconscious, but maybe they're drinking, having a good time, and then having, uh, you know, consensual uh, making out with someone just because at that point, um, then they can say no. You know, at that point they could say no. But if someone takes that too far, if they believe, oh, well, because you know, she's allowing me to do X, Y, Z, now I can continue to actually have sex with her, that's not okay. So again, that falls into like the victim blaming part of things. Um, also a myth or a misconception is that it can't happen to males. So right. sometimes people think that, um, rape can't happen to a male, and that's not true. We have um, any type. I've been at the DA's office for 18 years, and I've seen any and all types of sexual assault cases come through, sexual assault reporting. Um, and then one of the, another important ones to mention is um, late reporting. So oftentimes people might think that a survivor is going to um, have a sexual assault occur and then run to their local law enforcement agency and talk about it. Um, I think people think that's what they would do. You know, oh my gosh, something really horrible happens to me and I'm gonna run right down and tell the police or call the police. 
Um, that doesn't often happen. Often what we see is late reporting and that's because they're trying to figure out what happened. Like, I was having a good time, I was doing this, I trusted this person who I either wanted to go out on a date with or you know, had an acquaintance um, relationship with and then all of a sudden you know, I was raped or I was taken advantage of. So um, they're trying to figure out what happened to them. That may take a day, that may take hours, that may take a week. Um, so we can't blame a survivor once they're trying to figure out what happened and how they're feeling about what happened to them. Um, how long it's going to take them to, to report. Thank you. Amanda, uh, what would you like for the community to know about uh, non stranger rape? Certainly. Um, I think the main thing is, is that these cases are prevalent mm -hmm. and they often go unreported for a variety of reasons. Uh, often the criminal justice system is a scary place to go. Um, victims are sometimes hesitant because they don't want to have to relive these events over and over again. So what I would like the community to know that these cases should be taken seriously. It's, it's very easy, as uh, Julia said, to say, oh, well, they shouldn't have put themselves in that situation or they shouldn't have drank that much. Um, but these cases have long lasting effects on these survivors. Mm -hmm. So the community should take them seriously. Jury should take them seriously. Um, I often analogize it to a robbery victim. We don't tell a robbery victim, oh, well, you shouldn't have been in that place or it wouldn't have happened to you. We treat those robbery victims as true victims. Um, I would like the community to also treat our sexual assault victims in the same way. It doesn't matter that they, were, they went to this party mm -hmm. or that they had a couple of drinks. When you say no, no means no. Right. Uh, when you're that intoxicated, somebody shouldn't be taking advantage of you. If you go up to a room to lie down or to sleep it off, you shouldn't then wake up to somebody on top of you having sex with you. That's not okay. Mm -hmm. um, so fortunately, with some more high-profile cases going through the national level, the Brock right. Turner cases, the Dr. Nassar, the Bill Cosby case, right. the community is being more informed about some of these issues and just how prevalent it could be. Um, but I think there's still a lot of work to be done, a lot of education yep. for our community. One thing that I would like survivors to know is that our office is taking these cases seriously. We do look at them with a fine tooth comb. We do thorough review. We're not just making snap decisions, oh, we can't prove this, and shuffling it off uh, to a bin of rejected cases for filing. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we want to make sure that we're filing the right cases because they do have very high ramifications for those accused of these cases. But we do take very seriously taking victims' input, giving the victims a voice, actually speaking to the victims before we're making those charging decisions so that they feel a part of the process so that they're not re-victimized in coming forward. And hopefully that will enable us to get more of these survivors to report, even if it doesn't go to a criminal trial. Definitely. Thank you. Uh, Julia, what are some of the type of ways that a victim can report uh, these types of crime? Um, they can report um, by calling a crisis line, by calling, um, here in Yolo County we have um, the local domestic violence sexual assault shelter, which is, or center, is Empower Yolo, mm -hmm. and they are very, um, they're confidential, so any information that's given to them by a survivor, um, they keep to themselves. Okay. They, um, on the crisis line actually, you don't even have to say your name. Mm -hmm. So you can um, just talk and call and be anonymous and be like, hey, you know, this is um, something that happened to me. And then figure out later on, do you want to make a, a report? Then um, obviously you can call um, our office, the Yolo County District Attorney's Office, Victim Services we have. And then you have um, local law enforcement, so if they want to report there. And lastly, on any of the campuses like UCD, Woodland Community College, um, you can report, and um, at UCD they have also the care advocates right. that you can report to, and again, they're confidential, just there for survivors. Thank you. Amanda, um, how is the district attorney's office handling these types of cases? As I mentioned before, we're really trying to give survivors a voice in the process. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times victims won't come forward because they think that they won't be heard. They say, I don't want to go forward. We'll go forward anyways. Yeah. Um, a lot of times it's, it's difficult to report to officers. 
Um, so we're doing a lot of training with our officers mm -hmm. on how to do appropriate interviews with survivors, a trauma-informed interview where they're going to get the most valuable information, mm -hmm. the most truthful information that can be used should the survivor decide to go to to criminal trial. Mm -hmm. We've also been doing a lot of training within our office to make sure that our attorneys that do take these cases are well equipped, right. that they are getting the further investigation that needs to be done, that they are also treating the survivors in a trauma-informed way to get the most information. Um, Julia was talking earlier about um, some misconceptions and one of the things is, is that these survivors are going to remember things mm -hmm. chronologically right. and be able to regurgitate it back and forth and sideways and not hesitate, but they just live through a trauma. So mm -hmm. they're recording information in their brain differently. So approaching them with these trauma informed techniques, talking to them about their, their senses, what they were hearing, seeing, feeling, right. um, about the incident will often give you more information than just asking, what happened next, right. what happened next, and this cold interaction mm -hmm. with, with the survivors. So we're really trying to concentrate on that within our office. And then really, again, just giving them a voice, letting them have some control over the situation um, and some input into from charging all the mm -hmm. way up to what they want to see happen with the case should the person be convicted or plead to the offense. Um, and we work very closely with our partners and agencies within the community. Our office has actually formed what's called the Greater Davis Non-Stranger Sexual Assault Committee. Okay. And that um, is comprised of our, uh, our office DAs, mm -hmm. um, our advocates from our office, as well as uh, UC Davis Police Department, the CARE program and their advocates, Davis Police Department and any advocates from their office, as well as the Attorney General's office, and then also the Title IX office within UC Davis campus. And what we do is we collaborate, talk about strengths in cases, some weaknesses or struggles that we're having in putting together cases. Oftentimes we can't share all the information because of confidentiality purposes, but we have a lot of overlap, so trying to, to avoid those gaps and educating our surviving community that they have different options on where to go. They mm -hmm. don't necessarily have to go to the criminal justice route. They can go through UC Davis if they're a student through the Title IX office and go that route so that they feel safe. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, and Julia, um, what are the types of services um, that you guys provide uh, to victims? So when a case gets filed by the district attorney's office, so specifically for the Yolo County DA's office, mm -hmm. um, we are there when a case does get filed through the district attorney's office. Yeah. So um, the, it gets referred, we get the case assigned to us, I'm calling that victim, I'm saying this is me, this is who I am, and the, this is what your rights are under Marcy's Law, which is Prop 9 here in the mm -hmm. state of California. And there are 17 rights that are afforded to that person. So. I'm letting them know that. I'm letting them know that our, what we would like to happen at the DA's office is that they know everything that's going on with the case. Um, I'm giving them case status. I'm telling them the next court dates. I'm going with them to court if they have to um, testify, mm -hmm. or even if they just want to go because they want to know what's happening on that date. I can call them and tell them, okay, this is what happened, but they have every right to be present and hear it for themselves. And if they want to go, then we're going to be there with them. Um, and if they do have to testify, they have a right to have one of us sit next to them on the stand. So we're telling them all that information, and some of these cases can be lengthy in prosecution time, mm -hmm. so we're there that, the whole step of the way. Awesome. Thank you both very much. And um, for those watching at home, um, what are some of the agencies that they can contact um, in case these types of situations do occur? Some of the agencies that we talked about were, was Empower YOLO mm -hmm. here in YOLO County, um, the UC Davis Care Advocates, mm -hmm. um, UC Davis Police Department, Davis Police Department, any of the law enforcement agencies, obviously, yeah. and then, of course, the YOLO County District Attorney's Office and Victim Services that is within that. And all those agencies mm -hmm. are also listed on the DA website. Mm -hmm. which is yoloda.org. Okay. So if anybody was looking for any other contacts or services, they could always contact our office or look at that website, yoloda.org, to get that information. Awesome. Thank you both very much. And thank you for watching today's episode of In the Studio.